Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, tonight we are continuing on our teaching concerning the foundation, concerning the foundation. And we are going to be looking at tonight a very important aspect of building right from the start, which is what we have been dealing with. Tonight we have been looking, we're going to be looking at seven characteristics and requirements of the foundation, seven characteristics and requirements of the foundation. I hope that I'll be able to get through this tonight by the grace of God. Seven characteristics and requirements of the foundation, of the foundation. Now, this is a very important, important topic that we are looking at tonight by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean when we, when you hear that word foundation, what does it mean? Well, I'm going to give you the secular definition of what foundation means. Number one, it's the lowest load bearing part of a building. The lowest load bearing part of a building. That's the first thing that you need to possibly jot down when you talk about foundation. That's the first thing you need to jot down when you talk about foundation. It is the lowest load bearing part of a building. And so in that definition, it speaks of physical capability, physical capability. The second is an underlying basis or principle, an underlying basis or principle, which is primarily what I have been dealing with, uh, especially last week, to get you to discern what is or what are the thoughts, principles, and ideas and teachings that are in the foundation, that are going to make up the foundation. So this second definition, an underlying basis or principle, deals with ideas and teachings, ideas and teachings. The third is the action of establishing an institution or government or something. And so this third definition speaks to formative actions, formative actions. So watch this now. When we talk about foundation, there are three primary things that we can look at three primary things that go into making up a foundation. Number one, it's physical capability. Number two, the ideas and teachings. And number three, the actions that go in to establish that thing. And so those three things become, uh, I would say, the base construct of what a foundation is. Now, a foundation, according to uh, biblical uh, definition, the King James Dictionary, to be specific, it says, number one, it is the basis of an ed edifice. So we, we said that earlier, it's the part of a building which lies on the ground. So it's the, the part that holds up everything, the load-bearing part. Number two is the act of fixing this basis, which is the actions that are performed. Number three, the groundwork uh, by which uh, this thing is, is supported and what on which it stands, the groundwork on which it stands. So when you're talking about a foundation, you're talking about groundwork. You don't lay foundation without groundwork. Groundwork is not foundation. Please, let's understand that. You have to prepare ground before you can lay foundation. A lot of people think that laying foundation is groundwork. No, that's not true. You have to do groundwork before you can lay foundation. And in the sense of, let's, let's put it in context now. For example, God has given you a vision. You can't lay the foundation of that vision without laying the groundwork of prayer and research and preparation. So let's, let's understand this. There's groundwork that has to go in before you can lay a foundation. So for instance, Jesus is the foundation on which the world stands. The, the world rests in the palm of his hands. He's the foundation of salvation. He's the foundation of new creation. But was there a groundwork that went in before Jesus became the foundation? Yes, 
The Bible says he was crucified from before the foundations of the world. So there was some groundwork that went into play so that when God began to execute his plan and lay foundations, the foundations are being laid on some groundwork. Now, the next thing is when you talk about foundation, you're talking about an establishment, a settlement. Foundation establishes you. Foundation settles you. So if you're talking about being established, being settled, you have to deal with the foundation. If you don't deal with the foundation, then things are going to crop up that will affect what you are building. And so when God wants you to go higher, he takes you deeper. Let me say it again. When God wants you to go higher, he takes you deeper. He doesn't take you high first before he takes you low. He takes you low first before he takes you high because you have to get the foundation right to build what you're trying to hold. Hallelujah. And so foundation also deals with an endowment, according to this uh, biblical definition, an endowment, right? A donation or a legacy appropriated to support an institution. What is the endowment? Very deep within your foundation is the endowment of your grace and of your anointing. Your grace, hear me, your grace, I'm, I'm going around a curve, but some things you need to get your grace and your anointing does not come later on no it is right there in the foundation i can tell the extent of your anointing and your grace by the depth of your foundation by the depth of your foundation and what has taken place in the groundwork and in the foundation of what you are building and of who you are uh, uh, to, to, to take you to where you are going, to determine what level you are going and what level you are at. So don't be afraid when God is digging deep inside of you and digging you up and breaking up your fallow ground and plowing you. What he's dealing with is your foundation and going deep so that you can go high. Glory to God. All right. So that's the definition of foundation. Foundation. And of course, there are many other spin-offs to this that we can go into. Spiritual foundations, generational foundations, uh, ancestral foundations, financial foundations, all kinds of foundations that we can go into. But so you understand what constitutes a foundation. It's physical and spiritual capability. It's ideas and teachings and it's formative actions. What? Do you do what have been done to, to what have been put in place to get the foundation established? Hallelujah. That's a whole message by itself right there. Now, before any foundation can be laid, there are requirements that must be adhered to. In the natural world, when you are laying a foundation, these requirements that I'm giving to you, so I'm using the natural to parallel the spirit. These requirements that I'm giving to you are essential. If you, if you bypass any of them, you are going to be in trouble with the building that you are erecting. So here are the seven uh, natural requirements or secular or scientific requirements, if you will, in laying a natural foundation. Number one, Selection of site and soil. Selection of site and soil. You have to pick a site and then you investigate the soil condition. The soil determines the future outcome of the building when tested with nature's adversities. Hear me? Follow. Come on. Go from the natural to the spirit. You have to pick a site and investigate the soil and condition. The soil determines the future outcome of the building when tested with nature's adversities. One of the lessons I'm going to be teaching on this, hopefully next week, is building with adversity in mind. I'm going to be doing that next week. You don't want to miss that. It may not have been a, 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 a great strength the, the, you know, that, 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 that you use. Remember the parable of the sower and the seed. Matthew 13, verse 3 to 8. Pick a soil, select the site, pick the soil. You have to choose right. Let me tell you something about God. When God is choosing, 
He picks his site and he chooses his soil. Okay? You are the soil because you are made from dust. But he also chooses a site on which you are going to build. So God is, God is very strategic about the people that he chooses to carry out serious vision. He's very specific and he's very choosy about those people because he's not going to pick people and choose people that will fail or that will fail him. Any failure is on your own accord, not his, not his. Number two, survey. So after you have selected the site and soil, then you do a survey. You have to study, you have to inspect or examine the site so that the corners of the foundation can be laid in the right place. And this is determined by the type of building that will be constructed. If you are going to erect a, a, a 50 story building, your foundation cannot be small. The base of your foundation has to be wide. And so you have to understand that survey is important in the natural world to know where you can anchor the corners of your building, okay? And so God sometimes does that, right? He surveys, okay? And sometimes he allows us to be stretched beyond limits and you think that you are, you are you know, being unfairly treated. No, sometimes God, in, in the formative stages of your ministry, for example, you will find an explosion of grace and anointing and you will find that, oh, you will go to Africa and then you end up in Colombia and then you find yourself in Trinidad and you're ministering in Jamaica. And then after a while, you realize that none of that is happening again. What happened? The demarcations of your foundation have been laid. It has been laid. And so now the next level has to be done. Digging, you start digging. This is to define the depth of your foundation. This is where God begins to dig you. When God begins to dig you, he begins to, to go into the core and root of who you are. And he begins to use people to do it. He begins to use people to rob you the wrong way, right? To, 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 to scrape you the wrong way, okay? To, to highlight in you certain things to bring out in you certain weaknesses, to use people, to use you, abuse you, and refuse you, to see how you will react. Sometimes certain things that is going on with you, it is because God wants to get a reaction out of you. And the reaction that he gets out of you will now allow him to now formulate what he needs in the depth of where he has dug. In your weakness, he has become strong, okay? So let's, let's understand the digging process. Like I said, I'm just using the natural to parallel the spiritual, but we are going deeper. He now lays the footings, install the footings of the building. This will make your building sturdy and unshakable. Your foundation will rest on these. These are the teachings that go into your foundation. Every Christian must be taught right. And I told you about the six basic principles of the doctrines of Christ. These are the footings on which you will build your superstructure. These are the pillars of your foundation. Well, not the pillars of your foundation. Pillars go up, but footings go down. So these are the footings of your foundation, the strength of your spiritual understanding. And when you on these in the right way, no wind of doctrine can sway you. Okay, that's important. Then you have the sealing of the footings, right? This is to protect them from prolonged moisture. It is the Holy Spirit who does the sealing. He is the one who seals, all right? So the Spirit of God is necessary from the very beginning stages of your foundation laying. This is why uh, Paul went to a particular church in the book of Acts. I don't remember which church it was. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? And they said, we have not even so much heard that there was a Holy Ghost. Paul was stunned by this and he laid hands on them, prayed for them, and they received the Holy Ghost. You understand the Holy Spirit is important in the initial beginning stages of your Christian life. If you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you should pray for it. Pray for him to baptize you in, 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 in the baptism of fire. Very important so that your foundation can be sealed. The devil 
when he wants to destroy a Christian, he goes at their foundation. He examines their foundation to see where the weaknesses are. This is why it is important to allow God to deal with your weaknesses. This is why it is important to allow God to deal with the issues of your mind and your heart and your emotions. You understand me? And your thoughts so that what is not of God can be uprooted. Many of us, we are nursing wounds and pains that we have covered under the disguise of, of, of emotion, under the disguise of achievement. Okay, and many other disguises we cover it up under. But the moment we pull the disguise, you begin to realize that there are deep wounds under there that have not been healed. The foundation, this is important because the devil destroys you by virtue of your foundation. That's where he attacks. Okay, that's where he attacks. Number seven, number six, sorry, is the curing process. Allow for curing. This is for preservation and good health. Build and you build foundation walls. At this, at this stage, curing. Listen, at the curing process, sometimes you feel like you're on a shelf and God has gone from you, okay? You feel like there is nothing happening for you. You feel as if everything has ended. It is finished. It is over. Some of you, you can be on the, in the curing stage for one year, six months, some seven years, depending on the type of building that God is building in you. The curing process is absolutely important. This draws me back to the whole story of the potter and the clay, that when the Lord spoke to uh, Jeremiah and took him down, and took him down, spoke to Jeremiah, and took him down to the potter's house, and he saw the process Right, he saw the process of how you get a vessel from the clay stage, and part of that process is the curing process where you're put on the shelf and you stay there for a while. The curing process, then the protection stage, the seventh one, protection, where you apply sealer again to ensure the protection against moisture. This is the this is in type again, in parallel again, the spirit of the living God putting covering over your life at different stages, at different levels. He can bring that covering through a pastor. He can bring that covering through um, a divine marriage. He can bring that covering through mentorship, through apostolic covenant and connection. But the covering stage is absolutely important. Absolutely important. Now, I, I've just I, what I've just done for you is to give you the seven scientific natural requirements for laying a natural foundation and you are beginning to see how these parallel in the spirit okay every one of these requirements are important when we are talking about foundation when we are talking about laying a foundation now does god have spiritual requirements for his foundation. Are there spiritual requirements for God's foundation? I am taking you into what I call the seven necessities. The seven necessities for God's foundation to be laid in your life. And I want you to pay attention to these because this is where I'll be diving into the scriptures so that we can understand from the word of God a little bit more from God's perspective. Number one necessity or requirement is that your foundation must be word based w o r d word based w o r d now what do i mean by word based the foundation that is laid by god through any man by any woman must be based upon the word of God, the written word of God. We call it the logos, the word of God. In Hebrew, you will say it's the Torah, the word of God. And not just the word written, but the word spoken, the word spoken. So the, here are two things. The, the foundation that is word-based 
must be based upon the word of God written and the word of God spoken, the logos and the rhema. And it must be built, watch this now, upon the word person. It must be built upon the word who is the person of Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 1. Okay? Now, the word has three dimensions. The word is first a person. The word is secondly written. The word is thirdly spoken. And then there is a fourth aspect to the word which belongs to us which is acted or done. The word of God is absolutely important to building your foundation. Too many Christians are operating based on emotion. And you operating based on emotion. How? I give you a simple example. If, for example, they hear that prophet is coming, the first thing they want is a prophecy. They don't want the word written from the prophet. They want a prophecy. And if the prophet does not prophesy, then they judge him to say he's not a prophet. Because what? They have not been anchored in the word to realize that the most powerful prophetic word you can receive is a word of to your soul, your spirit, and your situation from the written word of God. Come on. You see, too many of us have been so fickle. We don't have any strength in us. We are so emotional that when nonsense is being told us, we don't know how to discern it. How are you going to discern whether or not a prophecy that I give you is from the Lord? It's not because you feel like the word I'm giving you is from the Lord. Your feelings can be off like, an, um, uh, like a, a broken clock. You understand? It can be off. But how are you going to know? It is by the word that is inside of you, not your feelings. Because some people will look at me and see me and they will say, I don't feel like I like him because they don't like all my hair cut. You understand? Because they have their own physical preferences and I don't fit their physical profile. So by that, they don't like me. And so whatever word I give to them, they feel like it don't come from God. Listen, there are some crazy things out there. But if you are anchored in the word as your foundation, then you can discern and tell when a prophet or a man or a woman of God is speaking a word from the Spirit of God. So here's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knows those that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The foundation of God standeth sure. It must be word-based. The only thing that is sure is God's word. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words will not pass. First Kings chapter 8 verse 56 says, Blessed be the Lord that hath given me rest, that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he hath promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Listen to me, saints of God. In your foundation, the word of God must be the surety for what you are building. If it is not being built on the word of God, there is no promise in it. And believe it or not, this is why a lot of ministries fail. Because they were not built, they were not founded, they were not started 
on the surety of God's word to the man or the woman who was building it. You cannot destroy something that God has built by his word. It is impossible to destroy it. Impossible. Psalm 138 verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Not just above thy name. He said all thy name. God doesn't just have one name. Above all thy name. His word is magnified above all thy name. So you see, look, the word of God is so important. Absolutely important in the whole matter of the temple of God. Luke chapter 21, verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So if we are going to build a foundation that is that has longevity, surety, durability, it must be word-based. No church can thrive on gifts of spirit only. None. Let me say it again. No church. No ministry. No man. No woman. Can thrive on just the manifestation of gifts. None. Because when adversities come, it is not the gifts that you are going to use. It's the word. When adversities come, it is not the supernatural manifestation of gifts. No, it is the word that will take you through it. The word. So if that is not in your foundation, then when the tests, the tricks, and the temptations come, then what's going to happen to you? You are going to falter. And see, we have been dealing with this in uh, uh, our Friday night sessions about backsliding. And if you are noticing, what is common amongst backsliders is that the word of God is absent from their life. Build right from the start. By allowing the word of God to become your base. Gifts, listen to me. <laughs> Gifts can be duplicated. Every gift that manifests in the church can be duplicated. But the word of God cannot be duplicated. When you hear it, you will know it. But it is hard sometimes to discern whether or not a gift is of God or it isn't. Except the Lord opens your eyes. Sometimes you can be fooled. No joke. Sometimes you can be fooled. Let me tell you a true story. I was at a prophetic conference. I was young in those days. So I used to look up to the prophets and go, ah, I want to be like that. And there was a prophet ministering. And the prophet was going, calling numbers, giving names, giving addresses, and saying all kinds of stuff. And suddenly, in the conference, my eyes opened. And I saw a snake that was hanging over the head of the man who was prophesying. When I saw it, I was frightened. I was like, what is that? I was so frightened as to what it was. During the conference, some strange things happened that when you examine them, you know they were not of the Lord. And people revered this man as a high-level prophet, as a powerful prophet. But what I saw allowed me to know that this man was not operating by the spirit of the Lord. There was a mixture. 
there was something else going on. And they used their flamboyance, their theatrics, their, their stage presence, their, their voice to mesmerize people and to sway them from seeing truth. And when you hear them speak, maybe the only time the word is mentioned is when they quoted the scripture and then nothing else after that is connected to the scripture they quoted. Nothing. You see, if we are going to have discernment in this hour, we need the word to be our foundation. We need the word to be our foundation. Hear me very well, since as I'm on this matter. A true servant of God, a true servant of God is one who brings the word written to you. A true servant of God is one who brings the word written to you. If he's not coming with the word written, watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Either they are fake. Either they have gone away from the word. Or they are not yet developed to be doing what they are doing. A true messenger of God brings the word of God, not his opinion, not his mindset, not his feelings, not his own thoughts. God's word, undiluted, raw to you. I've just posted some scriptures in the chat so you can take those down on the number one word based the foundation has to be word based number two the foundation must be good the foundation must be good now let's look at this first timothy chapter 6 verse 19 laying up in store for themselves a good foundation a good foundation this is first timothy chapter 6 and verse 19 let me read for clarity, from verse 18, from verse 17, sorry, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, not trusting on certain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, in context, the good foundation here is the good works that the rich is, is, is doing. But how can the rich do good works except they pursue godliness? How can you pursue godliness except you pursue the word of God? So everything is connected. So now, the foundation must be good. Any foundation you're laying, it must be good. The foundation must have the quality of God's goodness in it. This means that the foundation that is laid does not have anything evil, anything unpleasant, or anything dark in it. That is the intentions and the motivations of the one who is laying it is connected to the will, the purpose, and the character of God. You cannot, hear me saints of God, you cannot Lay a good foundation with someone who is hurting, with someone who has dark and evil intentions, with someone whose life is not pure. One of the problems, and I'm, and I'm going to speak tonight because we have to learn and we have to understand how to fix some things that have gone wrong in our life. One of the things that happened to us as Christians is that we are being fed from altars that are contaminated. The altars become contaminated because the altars were laid by people, by men and women who possibly broke away from another church for one reason or the other. And they go and start a ministry. 
and they go and they start that ministry on the pain, on the hurt, on the anguish. You, the individual, you are building, but what you are building is an outwork of what is inside of you. Your spirit and your soul is going into the thing that you are building. This is why, here it is. This is why, my God, pray for me. I'm, I'm having a little headache. This is why the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that when the angels came down, they did not say, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with his holiness. Have you ever wondered why they didn't say the whole earth is filled with his holiness? Why did they say the whole earth is filled with his glory? Do you see any starlight sparkling anywhere? No. What you see is the creation of God. The creation testifies that God is. And everything that God creates is a reflection of him. Everything that he has created is a reflection of him, some part of him. Therefore, glory is a reflection of the, the, the manifest uh, uh, presence of God in tangible form. So we are interacting with the glory of God when we participate in, in, in what God has created, when we partake rather in what God has created in the earth realm. Now, let's go back. If you as an individual is building your Christian life, but you don't allow the Lord to remove the things that are evil, the things that are dark and the things that are unpleasant, you are going to build your temple on a weak foundation. Weak. Have you ever seen some leaders that the slightest thing gets them annoyed, angry, and they are ready to destroy you rather than to restore you? And you wonder, why is this man of God like this? Why is this woman of God like this? When you check it, you go back to their foundation, you will find some things that have not been dealt with, some areas that the word of God did not deal with because they refused the word of God from dealing with that. What will happen is that these people will now come under the fullness of either the wrath of God or the hand of God breaking them and breaking building, putting them aside, putting them down to get that darkness out of them for however long it takes so that they can go and build what they need to build. Some people never recover. It is important, brethren, that you, in your initial stages, deal with the darkness the evil intentions, the unpleasant things that is in your background. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you don't yield to the working of the goodness of the word of God in your foundation, then what you build can be easily destroyed. Because what the devil will attack is your personality to destroy what you are building. A lot of people get destroyed. Why? Because their personality or their character was attacked. And it found basis because in their foundation, there are things that they have not dealt with. Don't tell me that this is how your granny used to do it and your grandpa used to do it and your mama used to do it and your papa used to do it. How does the word of God do it? That's what you need to adopt. That's what you need to, what you need to carry on. That's what you need to cement in your life. Don't come to me and tell me that this is who I am and, and this is how I am. No, 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 no. I don't buy that. I don't take that. I don't accept that. When you come to Christ, he transformed you to become like him. 
because he is the perfect representation of what a man supposed to be. The goodness of God. Number three. I'm telling you, this is serious. Hope I get through this tonight. Number three. Your foundation must be grounded on righteousness. Now, let me, let me backtrack a bit. Have you ever seen a Christian? There is no goodness inside of them. When you find a Christian that there is no goodness in them, Jesus have mercy. You, you are wondering to yourself, what is this for God's sake? What kind of person is this? What kind of individual is this? Do you know why people would rather <clears throat> to employ a Christian in their financial firm? Let's say if you're running a financial entity. I don't want a sinner. I want a Christian. Because the Christian, by virtue of who that person is or should represent, I know that the person won't rob me. I, will, I know the person won't defraud me. I know that by putting the person there, I have put in a layer of security that I don't have to pay for. Goodness in the life of a man allows people to be attracted to you and allow people to trust you without even knowing you. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Why, why does God want goodness to follow us? Why is it that God wants things that are good to follow us? Because he is good. Simple. I, I can't put it any other way. Because he is good. And the quality of who he is, he wants that in us. So if we are not good, if we are evil and dark and God, he knows what else we are. And we are not ex ex exuding, ex exemplifying, demonstrating the, the quality of goodness. Then we have failed in our first demonstration of our character as sons and daughters of God. Goodness must be in our foundation. Everything we do we must do it with the intent that it must be good. And so the outworking of that is a kindness, loyalty, trustworthiness, purity. These are the outworkings of this quality in your foundation. So if it is not there being demonstrated, then what will happen is that you have fallen short of the very first sign that you are a Christian. Love comes out of, somewhat comes out of this too. Benevolence comes out of this. You find some Christians, they are meaner than the devil. You understand? They don't even give away prayers. Not even prayers they give away. Much more to give you an offering of thanksgiving. Nothing. Why? Because the element of goodness is not inside there. Number three. I pray none of you are like that. Hmm? I pray none of you are like that. Number three. It must be grounded on righteousness. Righteousness. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Oh my God. As the whirlwind, the whirlwind is a representation of trouble, of storms, problems. So as the whirlwind passes, it's also a representation of the judgment of God. The wicked are no more. The wicked are destroyed when the storms and the judgment of God comes. 
but the righteous. The whirlwind cannot destroy the righteous. Come on. The storms cannot destroy the righteous. But I shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. My leaves shall not wither and whatsoever I do shall prosper. The righteous is an everlasting foundation. Righteousness is the quality of God that enables us to have right living. Right living. This is not rights according to what one think is right or rights that is afforded to one in the law or rights that is presumed by cultural affiliation, but rights according to the purity, morality, justice, and integrity of God and his word. It's according to the integrity of God to be fear to himself, fear to individuals, and fear to the individual's neighbor and to the environment. Here are, here are, here are the qualities. If, if you say that righteousness is at work, then watch this now. Righteousness must be fear to God, first and foremost. Then fear to the individual. Then fear to your neighbor. Then fear to the environment. Righteousness does not destroy. In other words, when we talk about your foundation is grounded on righteousness, it is balanced. There is no inequality or inequity. None. It is balanced. So here we have your foundation must be grounded on righteousness, living right according to the purity, morality, justice, and integrity of the word of God in view of God, yourself, your neighbor, and the environment. Number four, your foundation, we're talking about the seven necessities or requirements of building a godly foundation. Your foundation must be eternal. What are you building? Do you know that there are some Christians that are not building their Christian life with eternity in mind? They are building their Christian life with a house on the hill and two cars in mind. And a couple million in the bank. When, when has it flipped? Who changed the word of God? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not, do not corrupt, nor thieves break in and steal. When has the word of God changed? Why have we not, why, why do we not have eternity in view? We are living as if Jesus is, is not coming back again. So we are trying to get our piece of, of, of utopia here on earth. Have we forgotten that the Bible says this whole earth will be destroyed, that the heavens will be rolled up, eh? that they, they will burn with fervent heat, the elements are going to melt, the earth is going to be burnt. So what's your, what's your problem? Why aren't you viewing eternity in mind? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. We, are, we have somehow flipped it, that there is a prophetic wickedness that has come in the church, that has flipped the word of God, where we are seeking, uh, what is said, seek ye first the kingdom and all other things. We are seeking all other things before we seek the righteousness. Number four, eternal. The foundation must be eternal. Lay up in store, 1 Timothy 6 verse 19, in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. The time to come. You are building with the time to come in mind that they may hold on to eternal life. If what you are building does not help your eternal value, stop wasting your time. If what you are building does not help your eternal value, stop wasting time. Stop wasting time. The foundation that is being laid must be due and able to last throughout your lifetime. The lifetime of the individual and beyond. 
once it is built upon the word, its durability is guaranteed no matter the tests that will come against it in time. Once it is built, do you know why the church can never be destroyed? They can lock down the buildings. You still can't destroy the church. You can take every Bible you can find and burn it. You still cannot lock down the church. You can shut down every electronic Bible on the internet. You still cannot lock down the church. Why? Because the church is founded upon the word. Not just the word spoken, but the word person, the word written, the word revealed, the word bled, the word risen. You cannot, it's impossible to destroy the church because the church is eternal. Why? Because its foundation is built on the word of God. Number five. So if you're going to build your foundation, let it be with eternal prospect in mind. Why are you doing this? Is it because you want to stand on a platform before thousands of people? Is it because you want to teach a few? Is it because you want to write one and two books? No. The reason why you are doing it must be because of eternity. I'm not charging you. Why? Let me tell you why I'm not charging you. Because when I go to heaven, I'm going to bling. When I go to heaven and I have all my diamond studs all over my face, eh, some of you are going to be blinded by the light that is coming from me because you're going to wonder, when did he amass this wealth? It was when I was teaching you without price and without reward. Yes, I'm building with eternity in mind. You understand? Eternity in mind. Not just now. The now will take care of itself. I have proven that from the day I accepted to walk with the Lord in full-time ministry. The now will take care of itself. I'm, I'm not concerned about the now. Eternity is what I am concerned about. So build with eternity in mind. Number five. I, now let me backtrack. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me tonight. You see, when you find a man or a woman who is helping you to build with eternity in mind, that man, that woman will never be threatened by what you carry or who you are. Sip on some water for that. Let me say it again. When you have a man or a woman who is helping you to build your foundation, to lay your foundation, he or she will never be threatened by what you carry and who you are because they are not interested in the small little things of the now. I'm not saying the now is not important, but the bigger picture is eternity. They are not just preparing you to stand on a stage. They are preparing you to stand before Christ. You see, this is how you'd know the difference between men who are sent by God and men who went by themselves. Let me say it again. This is how you know the difference. One of the ways you know the difference between those who are sent by God and those who went by themselves. They help you build not to stand on platform, but to stand before Christ. The true offices of Christ does not destroy you, but build you and equip you to be like Christ in the earth realm. A true apostle, a true prophet, a true evangelist, a true pastor, a true teacher who is sent by Christ with the spirit of the office of Christ is not interested in your platform and the thousands, and the twos, and the tens that you stand before, and what you achieve and do not achieve. They are interested in equipping you to function like Christ in the earth realm that you may be able to stand before him in eternity realm. Glory be to God. 
Hallelujah. That deserves an amen. Number five. The foundation must be divinely principled. Divinely principled. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows those that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Iniquity. Now, what is iniquity? Simply put, immorality, injustice, wickedness, evil. But here's a definition I'm going to give you for iniquity. The propensity to do evil. Let every man depart from the propensity to do wickedness. The inclination to do wickedness. The desire to do wickedness. Let every man depart from iniquity. In other words, your foundation must be principled by the principles of Christ. You live by principles. Principles. Two principles that I want to give you. Number one, redeemed men. Two that are mentioned here. One, redeemed men. You must be redeemed. God knows those who are his. You can't fool God. And two, living redeemed lives. If you are redeemed, live redeemed. We must give up all iniquity and separate from sin. Listen to me, friends. I've often heard people say, Prophet, how can I do this? Prophet, how can I do that? And I tell them, simple, make a choice. Make a choice. Make a choice. Stop beating around the bush. Stop skirting around the edges. Make a choice. You live or you die on the choices you make. You are made or broken on the choices you make. Life is about choices. You don't believe me? The Bible says, I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your family may live. That's what God said to the Israelites. He said, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. Life is about choice. You can choose whether or not you are going to be this or be that, it's a choice that you make. And your choice becomes cemented by your actions and your way of life. So as a redeemed man, live a redeemed life. If a foundation is being laid by an individual who is not redeemed, then it is possible that the foundation may be laid with actions that may have negative outcomes in the future. These actions provide the cracks for the devil to destroy, take possession, or manipulate the foundation. Hear me, saints of God. I'm, I'm, I'm going to dive into this. Number one, when you come to Christ, come to Christ. When you come to Christ, come to Christ. Don't look back. Don't think back. Don't desire back. Don't go back. Come. Leave everything back, back, and go forward. That's the first thing. Number two, live for him. You might not know everything, but live in the revelation you have. Live holy, live right, live pure. Now, when you do that, even if you get a man or a woman who teaches you from a place of impurity, the fact that you are pure, it will protect you from their impurity. Yes, it will have implications. Yes, it does. But their impurity cannot destroy you. It cannot. 
because you have begun with purity and you are continuing with purity. But what if there are areas in you that are not redeemed? Because though we go under the water, many of us, there are some parts that didn't get wet. <laughs> you have heard me say that some of you need to be rebaptized with your mouth opened so the water can go in your mouth, wet your tongue, and almost drown you so that you can come to a near death experience eh? so that you, you can be redeemed. <laughs> Jesus, help me tonight. <laughs> yes. You see, redemption is important. Every area of our being, remember, we are tripartite spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is redeemed. Your soul is being redeemed. Your body is being redeemed. A process, even though it is done once, you have to live out the process of redemption. And so there are areas that you must open up to allow the blood to reach there. How does the blood of Jesus reach areas and aspects of a man by the word of God. The blood of Jesus, hear me, you might have never heard this before, but I'm going to tell you this. The blood of Jesus is the word bled. The blood of Jesus is the word bled. So hear me, hear me. Some of you, you are interested in spiritual warfare and all of that kind of stuff. You can plead the blood all you want. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. If you don't back up blood of Jesus with the word of God, all you are doing is blood of Jesus in. That's all. <laughs> Nothing more. You are just a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. The blood of Jesus must be backed up with the word. And so if you're, if you're saying it from a place of revelation of the word, then it goes with more power. Even the Rasta man said blood of Jesus when he nearly dead. <laughs> hey, Jesus, help me tonight. So when we talk about divinely principled, your brethren, must be built on the principles of the word of God. Depart from iniquity. Live a redeemed life. Live a redeemed life. The next aspect of this is that if there are cracks in you, in your foundation, because you have not departed from iniquity, or departed from certain kinds of behaviors and mentalities, what will happen is that the enemy will now send in intruders to either destroy, take possession of certain things and aspects of your life. For example, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. If you're trying to build a ministry for argument's sake and you have not dealt with your ancestral roots, at some point in time, the devil is going to fire at your ministry and lay claim to it because you have not dealt with the ancestral issues. And you see some ministries, they start very well and they like a firebomb. And then after a while, you see them plateau and die. And there is no transfer, no nothing. They just come up on the scene and disappear like a bubble. Is that the intent of God? No. When you check it out in the foundation, there are ancestral issues that have not been dealt with. And then the devil comes, lay claim by, by, by legalities. And because there is no defense put up, by virtue of the blood being applied, then there is no mercy guaranteed. And so the thing is destroyed. Second example. 
The enemy can come in and take possession. We're talking about the foundation. Take possession of things in your life because in the foundation, there are cracks. So for example, let's say before you came to Christ, you used to do some chikini things to get money. And you build your life on wealth. If you have not dealt with that, hmm? if you have not dealt with that, what can happen is that the enemy comes in again at the point of where you are high, at the high point, and now take your house from you, take your car from you, take your business from you, take your marriage from you. He takes something. Why? Because there is a crack in the foundation as it relates to how this thing was received in your life and you're building on that crack and he comes in and takes possession of it and there is nothing to stop him. Why? Because the blood did not reach that area to redeem it. We have dealt with several cases in deliverance. Some of them, God redeems the property and they can keep it. Some of them, they have to get rid of the property because they can't keep it. It's God's choice. But the blood has to go there to determine its scope of redemption. Number three, manipulation. For those of you who have not yet listened to my teaching on manipulation, go to my YouTube channel and listen to my teaching on manipulation. If there are emotional issues in your foundation, if there are issues that are connected to your father, your mother, that have brought about pains in your life, this manipulation is going to be one of the results and one of the outcomes. You can't deal with manipulation without dealing with the crack in your foundation that is causing it. And so when we talk about your foundation being divinely principled, we're talking about having nothing in your foundation that the enemy can use as a point of attack to destroy, take possession of, or manipulate. Very important. Number six, your foundation must be immovable. Immovable. Luke 6, verse 47 to 48. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he's like. He's like a man which built a house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. The foundation requires actions that are Christ centered built upon the integrity and the examples of Christ. That is what will make it immovable. Christ becomes the benchmark for everything that is done. If you want an example of how to be a prophet, you go to Jesus. If you want an example of how to be an evangelist, you go to Jesus. If you want an example of how to be a teacher, you go to Jesus. Whatever example you are looking for, go to Jesus. Build your life upon the examples of Christ. The rock that has been laid, the sure foundation, the cornerstone that cannot be moved. Number seven, build your foundation on Jesus Christ. Build your foundation on Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 3 verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If Jesus is not the example that you are being given, run. I don't know how else to say it. If every if every time you go to Bible studies, all you are hearing about is me, 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 the teacher, the teacher, the teacher, the teacher. And what he has done and what he will do and what he is not and what he is and what he is, 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 and all of that. You're not building your foundation on Jesus. You're building it on the man. 
Now, when adversities come, how are you going to stand? When storms come that he never faced, how are you going to stand? When he falls, will you fall too? You see, we have to be serious now about our Christianity. And I make no apologies for this. That we must build on Jesus, nobody else. I'm tired of hearing about the man of God there and the man of God there and the papa there and the mama there. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? The examples of anointing that we seek must not be men, must not be that which is demonstrated through men, but that which is divinely deposited through Christ into us. I remember I went to uh, St. Lucia and a young man came to me and said, Prophet, I want you to pray for me because I want what you carry. And I said, the Lord rebuke you. He was taken aback by what I said when I rebuked him. And he said, why did you rebuke me, prophet? I said, your prayer is wrong. It is wrong on many levels. And I began to explain to him. I said, your prayer is a setup for me to die and a setup for you to die. I said, never you ask for what a man carries. I said, can you live the life I have lived? Go through the things I have gone through. Bear the burdens that I have borne to carry the grace I carry. He said, I don't think so, prophet. I said, you're right. Because I've been doing this from the day I was born. From the day I was in my mother's womb, it began. I said, how would you want to carry that now at this stage in your life? I said, let your prayer be, Lord, release upon me the grace and the anointing that you desire to give me. You see, we have, we have been cultured to build on men and not on Jesus. Because men want to take the stage of Jesus Christ. But you can't. We cannot. To him, every knee must bow. I must present Jesus to you that you can become like the person I am presenting. I'm not presenting myself. This is why sometimes I quarrel with Pastor Diana. I say, why do you have to, to, to say all those things about me? And I give her a piece of my tongue and quarrel with her. Because I don't want people to see me. I want people to see Jesus. Jesus, I want them to see Jesus. If they see Jesus in me, I pray one day I will stand up and you don't see my face. Oh, you will see the face of Jesus. <laughs> and pastor will tell me, oh, but the people must know so that you can they can honor the man that God has sent. I say, yes, I know that, but I don't like it. But I understand why I should do it, but I don't like it. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. It's just that my preference. Because in everything, I want Jesus to be seen. More than how I am seen. And if you realize, you have been with me now for almost one year. April 17 or somewhere there, some of you is going to be with me now for one year on this online platform. And if you have noticed, I do not come here and boast about the supernatural things that I have encountered. And some of you might be wondering, does he encounter anything supernatural? What's that to you? There are some supernatural things. If I begin to tell you them, you'd be scared to death. Some things that I have encountered. What's that? Does that make me anything? Does that put me on any pedestal? Glory to God for those who get the miracle. They are the ones who should testify, not me. You ever see Jesus do miracle and then begin to testify of himself? It's the people that testify, not me. 
You see, there are some things that you, you have to understand. I only draw reference to some things if it, if it is necessary for my teaching. Let Jesus be seen, built on Christ, built on him. But there are these men, they come. And what do you see? Oh, I prayed for this one. And when I laid hands on this one, the devil began to manifest. And this began to happen. And they drop on the ground and begin to roll like snake. And blood began to come out of them. Ah, ah man of God, Papa, prophet. Why you pro Shut up and let Jesus be seen for God's sake. Let Jesus be seen. Let him be seen. Build on Christ. Have this mindset in you from now. So that when he begins to use you, when he begins to raise you, when he begins to beautify your life with the decorations of glory. Hmm? Ah, that's a prayer point right there. Oh God, beautify my life with the decorations of glory. When he begins to, to build you and decorate you with the decorations of his glory, let him be seen. The rock represents Christ. The foundation has been laid from before the foundations of the world. We, when we build on Christ, this means the foundation and everything that, that it does and produces must be in Christ, of Christ, and for Christ. It is being built not for our own glory, but for his. Why is the Holy Spirit building me? Because the Holy Spirit is building me. He is the one that is preparing me to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he building me? Because I must be a habitation of the Holy Ghost, a habitation of the Lord, a habitation of the Spirit. That's why. So when we build on Christ, then we will get the honor which does not come from men, but from God. You see, too many of us, we have accolades. Hmm? Accolade. Do you know who I am? Prophet, doctor. So what? Accolades. But no honor from God. Hmm. When God can speak of you, and say, I am pleased with you. You know that something is going on with your life. I tell you, I tell you something. The other day, a woman of God was praying for me. She began to prophesy and she said, prophet, the Lord said he's pleased with your heart. I began to tremble. That thing troubled me. It troubled me deeply. I said, is this woman hearing from God? I said, is this woman hearing from God any at all? I said, I heard what she said. I said, I know some of the things that came from the spirit. I know what is her desire. And I know what is prayer. But this one, did it come from God? God, please, with my heart. Me. Me. Hey. <laughs> Hmm. me, my heart. That thing troubled me for days. How can God be pleased with my heart? And I began to wrestle in my mind all the nastiness and iniquity and wickedness and you name it that I know is somewhere embedded inside of me that I'm trying to get rid of and struggling to remove. And God says, peace with my heart. That made me to, to, to walk with a deeper level of fear of God. Because you see, brethren, if your honor doesn't come from God, you have no honor. Men can say anything they want to say about you. But at the end of the day, what we are striving to hear is this. And I want you to make this statement, cement it in your mind. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you want to hear. You don't want to hear the second part. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. 
And there are many whom we have seen and revered that that statement will be their portion because what they built was never on Christ. It was on men, it was on money, it was on platforms. It was on puppy show, not on Jesus. So here you are, saints of God, when you are building, build your foundation on Jesus Christ. Build your foundation on Jesus Christ. Those are the seven necessities of building your foundation. The seven necessities of building your foundation. Glory to God. Amen. I think this is where I will stop for tonight by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I feel we should stop there. Let's talk. Hallelujah. Let's talk. Glory to God. Come on, let's talk. Here are the, here's a teaching tonight. The seven necessities of building your foundation. Hallelujah. Just to recap the seven, number seven, build on Christ. Number six, it must be immovable. Number five, divinely principled. Number four, eternal. Number three, grounded on righteousness. Number two, good. Number one, it must be word-based. Amen, amen, amen. All right, as usual, you know we got to talk. How does this teaching affect you, impact you? What are the areas of this teaching that spoke to you powerfully what are your questions are there any concerns unanswered things let's talk let's give some time so that we can discuss the issues good night sir good night i was i and good night everybody i the part that really stood out for me is the part where you said that goodness must be in our foundation yes and i when sometimes when you meet some persons persons who say that they are christians and and even persons who are preachers and so on and you look it is very sad to know that goodness is lacking yes there is there there is when when you when you meet some person, sir, you know, you know how you by the way how they, they live, by the way how they relate to you and relate to situations, you you know that they are not perfect, but you see kindness, trustworthiness, loyalty, benevolence, and all of those things coming out. But how do you deal with persons when you don't see? these things coming out and they are saying that they are Christians or they are pastors and so on. How do you navigate your way around them? Some hmm. of them, you can't not deal with them. You have to deal with them because they are in your space. But you, say, you, 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 you find some form of, how do, I'm not, just, just give me some idea of how, how you would deal with, with a person or persons that... Oh, yeah goodness seems to be lacking and just um, being here tonight you realize that this has to be part of the foundation yes um jesus made a statement he said do not repay evil with evil but repay evil with good right do not repay evil with evil but repay evil with good how do you deal with these people? You deal with them by being good to them. You don't allow their actions to dictate your actions. 
We don't allow that. Let your goodness be the rebuke that God will use against them. It is not in my place to change anybody. I can't change anybody. It's the word of God and the spirit of God that does that. But my actions can have impact. And so how you behave around them must be a testimony against them. By doing good, you heap coals and fire, coals of fire upon their head. You understand what I'm saying to you? So let your actions be actions opposite to what they are doing. Be good to them. Be kind to them. Be gracious to them. Don't render evil for evil. But repay evil with good. Hallelujah. And then pray for them. That God will change their heart. Because God knows how to get to a man's heart, you know. He knows how to get to people's hearts. So pray for them. And while praying for them, you allow your actions to do the speaking. And for adventure in time, God may very well open the door for you to teach them, to say some things to them that might very well bring about the change. If that doesn't happen, then God will deal with them in his own time and is it in his own way. Hallelujah. Prophet Bernard, good evening. Good evening, Janet. Um, is it a matter of process or is it a matter of foundation or can it be both? So while you're teaching, I'm there and I'm saying, it's like at one point in time, I got I started saying, Jesus, why would you do such a thing? I've made some blunders listening to you. And it's like, I'm saying, God, how can you be so stupid? Why did you do that? And it's like, I catch up on myself and say, you know what? Experience teaches wisdom. I don't want to experience everything to learn, but is it that it's going to be a process where you made mention that the blood did not come into all areas? So some of us believe that when we get saved, the blood of Jesus will just automatically touch every area, but you realize that it's as you go through life that you're realizing and you're learning, you know, you shouldn't have walked this path or you shouldn't have done that. Is it a process or is it that it's just strictly the foundation that has the cracks? All right. Um, okay, let's take it from this point. If, okay, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should grow that when he's old, he will not depart from it. Teaching is important in order to bring about a desired result if there is proper teaching then you will get proper result as long as the teaching is right and it is adhered to people are people and will always be people and they will always do what they want to do but there are many factors that go into how a person behaves okay um, there is the ancestral factor there is the personal factor. There is the environmental factor. And there are the other influences that may come and um, determine. But what is not strong in many of us is the influence of the word of God. To be that factor that influences our mind, thinking, behavior. And very rare you find a man who is wholly and totally influenced by the world. And so there are areas in our life that might not have been touched by the word. And I say the blood must reach certain areas. I'm by no means saying that the blood does its work partly because once the blood touches your life, you are saved. But then the sanctification process begins, okay, redemption and sanctification process. The sanctification process is where you uh, 
allow areas of your life to be submitted to Christ. Okay? And so God can redeem that area through the sanctification process. Now, there are areas where if the word of God is not in control, then what God will do through his love is to bring you into experiences that will break you. So that you can now go to the word to mend it. Okay. And, where, and where the word begins to mend those weaknesses, then hear what happened. A threefold cord will not quickly be broken. You understand because the word now becomes the bond in that area of your life or the cement or the foundation or the pillar in that area when you are broken he wants you broken god wants you broken you understand he wants us broken so that he can fix us the way we should be fixed because mm. we are already broken you understand it we are already broken. We are for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are broken. In sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We are broken, but we are behaving as if we are whole. And so when you come to Christ, what happens is that where the word is absent, the experience of the process will take you back to the word so that it can be fixed. Is it wrong when... I know growing up, there was this thought that, for example, with, with Samson, um, the prophecy that was over his life, but yet still he, he seemed to have died, fulfilled the prophecy, and he's, he's dead. Um, there are persons God call, and they end up, or it seems they end up in a bad way. Is it that we can pray and say, God, um, <laughs> is it that you can say, God, um, I know you're coming. Do what you will, but don't let me end up like one of those men. Is it wrong? It's not wrong. I mean, we should pray and ask God to keep us. Samson's story is unique. You have to understand that God's word cannot return to him void. So even in Samson's mess, God will still fulfill his word because his word is still more powerful than your mess. As long as his word has gone forth, it cannot return to him. Okay. So, yeah. you know, Samson's story is unique. Samson never had to go the route that he went, but because he took the route that he took based on his desires, then God had to fulfill his word nonetheless. It didn't take God by surprise. I want you to know that because at one point, the Bible said they didn't know that Samson was led of the Lord. You understand? In some of the things that he was doing, these are some hard things to fathom. You understand? Yeah. Even, you know, in the scriptures. You understand? So it, it makes us humble students of the word of God because we think that, oh, this is the way God works. When you look at some places and you realize that God said Nebuchadnezzar is his servant. Really? <laughs> you understand? So you have, you, have, you have to humble yourself. When you come to the Bible, you have to mm -hmm. come as a humble student ready to learn from the yeah. Lord because there are so many riches and depths inside there that when you begin to dig it, it blows your mind. Honestly sure. speaking, and then you can only look at God and say, Ah, this kind God, oh, I never see yeah. your kind, oh. You understand? I don't understand yeah. you, oh. Yeah. And yes. you just humble yourself at his feet, oh, and say, yes. Lord, I submit to. Oh. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes. All right. Prophet. God bless um, you, Kim. Um, listen, I I think from all the teaching that you have you have been teaching is like I'm just in love with building right from start. From you, you have started the last few weeks, this topic is like I cannot get it out because it is so important. Mm -hmm. The foundation is important. Everything else can come afterwards, but the foundation it must start right. And yes. you gave the see you gave the seven um necessities for god's foundation and when i look at it i'm like okay i'm trying to to look at ones that would fit um for my yes. life and i'm like okay i love one i love seven and i love five because mm -hmm. i just think that once you have one five and seven then two three four and six can come but yes. then we need all seven 
That's and right. and and being Jesus Christ as the main one. And when That's I look at it, even when you're teaching and you started breaking down the divinely principles, when you started talking about redeemed men and living a redeemed life, that's a problem that I see happen all the time. Christians, they don't live that life. And mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I, I'm very radical. Um, I, I, I do talk out a lot and sometimes I get in trouble because I think if you're in the kingdom, you stay in the kingdom. You don't have one foot in and one foot out. And the yeah. Lord said, come as you are, but he didn't say stay as you are. So I'm expecting that when we become children of God, there must be some changes. Everything, you must be transformed because that old man drop off. And then when I look again, when I look at it and I see that the word is so important because a lot of people, Dr. Sinners use the blood of Jesus. Everybody use the blood of Jesus, but can you use the blood of Jesus and not serving God? What is it doing? It's not doing it's not. nothing. You just keep exactly. you just keep repeating the word, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, right? So the word is important in us as children of God. That 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 is a foundation. It's the base. And mm -hmm. and and then when I look also, when I go back at um when you spoke just now about having Jesus as a foundation. I mean, let Jesus be seen. That for, for, for years I've seen a lot of persons when they talk about the things that they do. Oh, I pray for this person, they heal. I, I prophesy this, I do this, but we are not seeing Christ. We are not seeing Jesus be seen in everything. It is you, the man. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I mean, you're opening my eyes to a lot of things because I mean, um, I would not say that my foundation is perfect but I can now shape it to see where I was wrong and where I need to fix and where the wall never put up right or where in the foundation never mixed properly or something. So I'm so yeah. grateful because when, when I go through this, it's like, I am sleeping now and I am talking now and I'm singing now the foundation is like every topic I'm now speaking about. I'm like the foundation, the foundation, the foundation. I don't want to hear nothing else about the foundation, the foundation, <laughs> because it is, I'm telling you, even if I go on a, a Bible study, I'm talking about the foundation, the foundation, because if the foundation is not right, there is nothing, we can't lay anything. We can't, we, we can't structure anything. We can't put nothing in place. And you mm -hmm. said earlier that yes, we must train the children right. I wasn't. I I wasn't. I wasn't saved um, from a young um, a younger age. First of all, I didn't even go to church. You know, mm -hmm. so a lot of persons do not have that background of growing up into church. Yes, right. I grew up hearing people going to church, but. I was one of them that was going and and I and then since I started to go into church and I get to know the Lord I realized we must have the fear of God because once we fear God we are going to apply the word of God and we're going to do what the word say so I really appreciate the teaching I really appreciate it and I am I'm taking it and I'm applying it praise amen. God thank God amen I love that you know that when you were talking and you said, you know, about redeemed men, redeemed Christians, we're not living redeemed. What, what, what does that really mean? Again, you know, I'm looking at that and um, you can get some things even by the definition of redemption. It's to compensate. It's compensation for, um, how did it put it now? Uh, compensation for faults or bad aspects of something or to regain a possession um, to regain possession of something or to be free from what distresses or harm us a lot of times we realize that we hold on to some things and we think it is good for us to hold on to it this is me this is who i am this is my this is my personality and you don't realize that that behavior that attitude if you allow Jesus to remove it and put in the necessities that are required, maybe a quality of the fruit of the spirit, for example, to go there, you might just be reaching 10 when you can reach 10,000 
if that aspect of your life is dealt with. Okay? And the devil makes us think that that which harms us is good for us. Yes. You understand? Mm -hmm. So the things that harm us are normally sweet, are normally tasty and desirable. But the things that are good for us aren't tasty and desirable. And, and so when God's word comes to us, you know, I often say, <laughs> if it is too sweet and massaging your ego too much, and your desires too much watch it watch it watch it because if every time you come before the lord all he has to say is what i'm gonna do for you and what you're gonna be and what he's gonna bless you with and but never addressing your soul your character as some of us dirty body no brethren yes some of us nasty you know some of us dirty. We look pretty outside, but inside we are a cesspool of mess. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And, and none of that has been dealt with. And now watch what happens. You, you are around a pastor, a prophet, an apostle, whoever, that has been constantly massaging your mess. Now when you come around a prophet now, who says, no nah, man, that thing stinks. I cannot stand that. Stand that. You have to get rid of that. And here is why. The word of God says, blah, 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 blah. You're going to feel uncomfortable around this man because he's attacking your personality. He's attacking your character because your character does not conform to what redeemed man should look like. Oh, yes, Jesus. And so you have to be careful of the prophets that people aren't afraid of. You have to be careful of the prophets that people love. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Yes, I'm hearing You have that. to be careful of the prophets that people flock because they, they're saying nice things. Yes, yes, the Bible says that you must encourage, you must, you must uh, exhort and you edify. Yes, prophecy, it does that. But where is the rebuke? Hmm. Amen. Where is the where is the fixing of my mm -hmm. life to conform to righteousness yes. and to holiness and to purity? Glory you see, Houston got a problem down here. And this is why, you know, God has sent us back into the closet. Because we need to see ourselves in the mirror of the word of God. People are, 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 are beating up on themselves. Oh, church is not open and church is not this and church is not that. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Ah, oh, glory. So I'm pick, picking my spirit and I'm tired. This that is happening is not the first time it has happened. There are parallels in the Bible. When was it that God shut down the church? Shut down the temple. In the time of Jeremiah, when they were doing all that they were doing, and the prophets were prophesying good things and nice things, and the prophets were saying lovely things. Jeremiah came on the scene and said, hey, you all are going to go into captivity into Babylon. They persecuted Jeremiah. Did all kinds of things to Jeremiah. What happened? The Lord shut down the church. The temple was shut down for 70 years. Until Israel began to pray, the temple did not reopen. Hear me very well. The temple of the Lord did not reopen until a man got on his knees in his closet and opened towards Jerusalem his window because Solomon prayed on the dedication of that first temple and said, if they turn their face towards this place, that's why Daniel was doing it here from heaven. Okay. It wasn't because he loved to open window. It was a prophetic sig signal he was sending until you begin to pray until the church the church, me, you, he, she, the old lady, John, James, and June, begin to pray in our closets of home. Eh? The church will continue to have these flipping doors. 
that can't seem to decide whether or not they want to open or whether or not they want to shut. Because the next level of the power is going to be birthed out of our prayer. God is finished with this dispensation. If you don't see that you are blind as a Christian and as a prophet, God is finished with this dispensation of the apostolic and prophetic that is out there. A new is being raised up. When Nehemiah began to feel pain in his soul for the house of the Lord. Now let's parallel that. It's a sign that, look, you have to begin to have a burden in your heart for the people of God. You are the temple of the Lord. I'm not talking about buildings. That can be destroyed. We are the temple of the Lord. Until you begin to have a burden in your heart for people and their souls, God will not deploy you to build them. And there are many who will not be redeployed. Many will not be redeployed. They will either go to prison or be fired from the church by the spirit of God for whatever reason. Many will not be redeployed. But those who have a burden for the church. And so Nehemiah began his journey and he went. What did he repair? He repaired the foundations and the walls. He repaired them. And then when they repaired them, what did you see them do? They took the word of God for one whole day. Ezra stood in the sun, reading the Bible. One whole day in the sun. Some of you would complain if you're in there for five minutes. One whole day, the whole congregation of Israel stood up before Ezra, the priest, reading the word. So you see, what is going on is that redemption God has to redeem us because the way we have been going has been wrong. It has been wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. I'm not saying that everybody is wrong, but the system has been wrong. And we have birthed up messengers and, 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 and preachers in a system that is not geared towards Jesus Christ at all. But men, when you hear men right here in our country in Jamaica, a man is being uh, uh, consecrated into the apostolic and they lift him and carry him on, on, on men lift him up and carry him on, on, on their shoulder like they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. You know something is wrong with the church. <laughs> you know something is wrong with the church. Period. And there is no apostle or prophet to say, hey, that is wrong. You can't do that. You're not the ark. You're not the glory. You are not the one who shall be carried on men's shoulders. It's the Lord who must be carried on your shoulders. In fact, in your heart. So you can, you can see that they do all these things for show, puppy show, they call them. And they have titles and make men scared of them. And they take the highest title, apostle. And when that one don't work, they say they are professor, apostle. And when that one don't work, they say they are his excellency, the majesty, apostle, this. Jesus, help us. Eh? Help us. I hear your spirit, Kim. If I have a dog, hmm? let me tell you the truth. If I have a dog, and my dog give birth to a puppy, and my puppy, the first thing he says is, oink, oink, I kill him, that dog. I said, I kill him, that dog. I am finishing that dog. Because how can dog give birth to pig? Hmm? How can dog give birth to pig? Here's the problem that the Lord is having. We are being born again. And we are supposed to be sheep. Hmm? But we're barking like dogs. When God look at us, he doesn't see sons. He's seeing reprobates. 
and you came through the blood and through the water. Huh? So you know God has to step in and do something about that. Because there's no way that the womb of the Holy Ghost can produce something contrary to what the womb must produce. So what is born again in these people? Through what are they coming? Is it Jesus' blood or some donkey blood or something? <laughs> anyway, let me stop. Let's have somebody else. Some people didn't come through the blood of Jesus. They come through donkey blood. Uh -huh. Yes, so what is wrong with that dopey dog pig dee pig pig do? Uh, <laughs> what are you asking me, woman of God? God don't make nothing contrary. He said the Bible says everything after its kind. You ever see dog and pig merge together? Well, some of us we merge with some things that only God knows. Hmm. Let's have somebody else, one more. And then I will leave you. Glory to God. Who else wants to talk to me? Nobody else wants to talk to me. How did this teaching touch you tonight? Which part of it touched you? What are your questions? You don't want to talk to me? What's going on here? Jody's eh? hand is up. Excuse me? Jody's hand is up. I don't see Jody's hand. Yes, it is. Oh, good night. Ahead, Good night. Good night. Don't just put up your hand. Just open the mic and talk. No, I couldn't talk because mommy's computer is on as well. Say so whatever right. feedback. So I had to move the, to another room. Okay. Um, the part of the teaching that touched, well, kind of triggered something was the part that talked about how the Lord sometimes allows persons to rub you the wrong way. Yes, and to get you upset and to basically to be a nuisance in your skin to bring mm -hmm. out a reaction yes right <laughs> no it's so hard because sometimes when persons are continuously or consistently you know nickering at you sometimes you do react so sometimes instead of being you know oh you know remembering that a soft answer turn it away right sometimes you know you just get annoyed and snap so that one really, <laughs> that one really um, brought out, um, really touched me in terms of the teaching. And especially for persons like myself who tend to be more on the friendlier side, I find that a lot of persons tend to try to do that, to get a reaction out of you. Mm -hmm. So any advice? Yeah, I have many advices. In the book of Genesis 22, the Bible says in verse 12, and he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Did you hear what God said to Abraham at the time when he killed Isaac? Because as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac is dead. Hmm. He said, Abraham, eh? God was walking with Abraham from Genesis, uh, wherever that starts, from Genesis, I think, 15. Is it 15? Um, yes, 15. And God began to walk with him all those years, right? Yeah. And then what happened? After all those years of Abraham going through all those tests, God didn't know that Abraham loved him. You're telling me that God know that Abraham loved him at the point when he requested Isaac because he was going to do it. So he's saying God didn't know. That's not what the Bible said. God knew that Abraham loved him. But God also wants to experience your love for him. There is a difference between cognitive knowing and experiential knowing. Are you following me? Yes, it's like a lab. Yes, you have yes. there's a difference theory. between mm -hmm. cognitive knowledge and mm -hmm. experiential knowledge. Yes. God doesn't just want 
you to know that he knows. He wants to experience what he knows inside of you. And this is why experience is important. <laughs> and walking with Christ is important. He wants to experience the process with you. Behold, I am touched by the feelings of your infirmities. He wants a reaction out of you. If every time you're saying to a person, I love you, I love you, I love you. And there is no reaction. You wonder to yourself, this person, this person <laughs> hear what I said, or this person love me back. Eh? <laughs> You're gonna start wondering. God wants an experiential uh, 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 knowing with you. Yeah. And so He brings people into your life, different kinds of people. Those who will rob you the wrong way, those who will rob you the right way. Different kinds of people that will produce reactions out of you. Because if somebody comes and robs you the wrong way and you respond the wrong way, then there's an area that God wants to deal with. But how does the wrong people stop robbing you? When they rob you and the right reaction comes out of you, render yeah. not evil for evil, but mm -hmm. repay evil with good. That's the right reaction to rob me being robbed the wrong way. You understand? Now somebody comes and robs you the right way. Gives you all the loving, all the nice things. But your reaction is one of pushing back at the person. You don't, you don't know how to receive love. You yeah. don't know how to see love in its purity. Every expression of kindness, you think it's a proposal for sex. Yes. Are you following me, Jody? Yes, I'm following. <laughs> You're sure? Yes, uh, right on it. <laughs> so, you see, God wants a reaction. Okay, so Prophet Bernard. Of you. Yes. Of you. Yeah, so and I like mm -hmm. a theoretical explanation of the experience. <laughs> the experiential <laughs> and the, the cognitive. But let's say, for instance, you know someone did something to you or has, um, let's say, for instance, has gone out of their way to for instance, do you harm? Yes. So when you see them now, do you, do you, <laughs> I mean, they're going to rob you the wrong way now. So what are you going to do? Rob them the right way? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I, in that I, I, case, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that. I'm going to show you. Okay. Go ahead. So like, okay, for instance, someone has placed an attack on your life, right? Mm -hmm. Would you continue, con what do you call it? Continue to be their friend or continue to be social with them? Or is it just if you sit them on the side of the road, then you can say hi and just keep it moving? That is that's, where that's I'm stupid. trying to figure it out now. That, that would be stupid. Okay. So that's what I was trying that, to That would out. be foolish because <clears throat> you don't put your hand in the nest of a viper. Okay. That would be foolish. Yes. So block and delete. Eh? So block and delete. Forgive and move on. Okay. Because you see, here what happens. You cannot force a person to mm -hmm. be what they are not. True. You understand? Go and read my chapter in 10 times better on friends. Yes, Friendship that matters. Already. Maybe I yes, should read it again. <laughs> and go listen to my teaching on that on YouTube. Friendship that matters. Yes. You understand? Defining your circles. Jesus defined his circles, you know, his yes. circle, you know. Mm -hmm. He defined his circle. If you are going to move ahead in life, <clears throat> you cannot have people in your circle that will destroy you. That's, so then, that's, okay, so that answers foolish. one of the questions. That if answers one question, but the other part is, mm -hmm. what do you do with them? You forgive. Yes. But how you deal with the spirit that is working through them? I have a simple answer to that. You see, <clears throat> What we don't understand, we misconstrue mm -hmm. the whole idea of Jesus' teaching about love your enemies. Yes. In that, he was dealing with the physical man. Yes, yes. But how do you deal with the spiritual? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spirits of wickedness in high places. Now yes. watch this, Jody. I have a simple method to dealing with this. 
<laughs> if my enemy physical comes and begs me water, you're getting water. Yeah. You understand? I would give them water too. Yes, because there is a code. There's a code yeah. of warfare that says mm -hmm. that the man who you feed cannot destroy you. True. Might be in a oh. teaspoon, but we'll give them the water. Okay. I will give him the water because in yeah. so doing, you put coals of fire on his head. On his, his warfare head. too. Yeah. You understand? But now, if he switches the battle and now come as um, zombie two of the hierarchy realm of the astral nine, <laughs> now yeah. I am going to draw from my sword. Yes. You understand? And say, okay, you have changed the battleground. Yes. Now I am going to meet you where the battle is being fought. Mm hmm now I am going to switch. Rabando The Bible says, suffer not a witch to live. I command every witchcraft spirit inside of you right now to feel the wrath of the judgment of the living God. I bring down every ailment and everything that you're projecting against me. The Bible declares that he who diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And I command right now by the power of the living God that what is being fired at me shall be fired back in the mighty name. Then they will know. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you see the difference? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So right. I might look simple <laughs> and I might give you the water, but don't cross me with wickedness and witchcraft. Yes. Because I will take the battle to where you are bringing it from. Okay. You see the difference? Yes. Now, the problem is this. Yes. A lot of these people have become one with the devil. Mm. So your warfare now becomes more technical. Yes. How do you now separate the soul from the demon that is behind the person? And mm. many times this is what happens. When they come to fight you, to fire at you, yeah. the Lord will not permit what they are doing to prosper against you. Yeah. It will go back and hit them and they will know that a higher power is with you. Yes. And by virtue of it going back and hitting them, but not destroying them, it's a mercy. It's an act of mercy to say to them, look, there is something higher than what you carry. Bow. If they refuse to bow, the mm. Lord will fight against them. The Lord shall fight my battles. Amen. You understand? Yes. 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 So you have to learn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Prophet. Um, the reason I had asked is because the person, like the specific person I was talking about, I have given them water multiple times. Yes. But they insist insist to even to the point where they have tried like inequity consistently so that's what i that's why i was asking well maybe you need to withdraw your hand from giving the devil water well i have withdrawn my hand for more than a year good more, yes. so leave it at that yes you see there are dynamics to things huh? yes all that's right, right. Okay, glory to god you. amen denia you said the what I see you said the what. What do you mean by the what? I want to make sure I... Oh, no, sorry. You were... When, uh, sorry, good night, Prophet. Good night, everyone. Sorry, good night. We were just speaking to Jody in your example about the astral something, something nine. I was like, the what? Oh. <laughs> but I think it was just the example. It's I okay. Was, That's, was, that one is on my mind. Yeah, I was just about making up... I was just making up a realm. You know, oh, okay. an, an evil realm there. there. I was but like, one, okay. I have not heard exist. this one before. It's, yeah, it don't, it don't exist. The astral realm does exist, but what I just oh. said is gibberish. All okay. right. <laughs> Amen. Okay. All right. Well, glory to God. Good night, sir. Good night. Oh, amen. Um, a couple of times, a few times now, I hear you make reference to what sounds like the idea or the principle of sending back the sender. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I have heard, I've heard multiple, multiple persons. Yes. Teach completely opposite. Yes. Thing, this idea. I've heard persons say, no, that is witchcraft. 
You're not supposed to do that. And then I hear some people come and say, yes, man, send back to sender. Can you please clarify how it is supposed to or not supposed to work? Oh boy, that's a whole teaching by itself. All right. When do you and when do you not? Is it biblical? Is it not biblical? There are scriptures that you cannot overlook in the Bible. I promise you, I will teach this. There are scriptures that you cannot overlook in the Bible. For instance, he who digs a pit shall fall into it. The trap that is set shall catch the one that sets it. Mm -hmm. You understand? And several other uh, scriptures, they're not, just, they're not coming to my head now. Um, you just caught me off guard. But an arrow, I think what has, what has happened, here, here's what has happened to a lot of Bible teachers. Mm -hmm. We have divided the Bible into two, Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah. And so because we have divided the Bible into two, we see a divided word of God. And we don't realize that the word of God is one. You understand? It is one. Yeah. How do you, I'm trying to, let me see if I can bring up my fire because you caught me off guard. That's not something I was going to teach. Oh. Yeah. Huh? Let me see if I can find something quickly to just deal with this matter. Um, just give me a second. Sure. Give me a second. Give me a second. Mm. Okay, where, where is this thing? Okay. Because I know a lot of people are interested in this, in this thing. Yes. Yes. Um, I promise you, I will, I will teach it. I will teach it. I will teach it. But not tonight. Okay. I will teach it. I will teach it. Oh, Jesus. Where, where are these files? Because there are scriptures that I don't want to just give you off the top of my head. I will teach it. Please, just bear with me. I will. I will. Right, no I will. I will. I will. You just caught me off guard right here. <laughs> Understood. Understood. No um, problem. I'm a bit tired, so I'm not flowing as I need to. Now, there are examples <clears throat> in the Bible, um, like, for example, Esther's story, um, mm -hmm. him and, and, the, um, and what he built. Um, yeah. There are stories, Ahithophel uh, and yeah. David um, situation. Um, let me see if I can remember any other. Um, and, and these are <clears throat> these are these are issues of because of one's goodness or whatever one's righteousness, the thing goes mm -hmm. back without even even um, you doing anything. Yeah. You understand? So there there are issues. Um, Proverbs twenty six twenty seven talks about whoever digs a pit will fall into it. And if someone rolls a stone, it will be rolled back on them. It will roll back on them. Here is, here is what I say about the Bible. Here's what I say about the Bible. So someone post Psalm 7, verse 15 to 16 there. Let me see that. I promise you, I will teach this. I will. Because there are dynamics and rules of and engagements of warfare. And when do you do certain things? He made a pity dig it and it's falling to the ditch, which he made. You understand? <clears throat> his mischief yeah. shall return upon his own head. Yes, this is one of them. And his violent dealing shall come down upon his own head. You understand? Yes. You understand? Uh, Sa uh, David and Saul is another example. Okay. Yeah. But here's the problem. The problem is that we have adopted passive Christianity. That's the problem. We have adopted passive Christianity and we don't see the, the other aspect that Christianity has an aspect of warfare to it that yeah. we are turning a blind eye and a blind side to. What is witchcraft? What really is witchcraft? Witchcraft is when you try to control the soul of another.
through evil power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, yeah. if what I'm giving to you, I don't want it. Why am I giving it? Why am I giving it? Didn't the Bible say, love your neighbor as yourself? Then yeah. why is it then that I should sit down? And I want you to think about this seriously. Mm -hmm. You're a father. Hmm? You're a father. Yeah. Every night your son comes under attack. God forbid. I'm just painting a scenario. And your son is coming under attack from witchcraft. What will you do? Oh, God bless the witch. Not at all. No, you won't. Not no, at good, all. no good father is going to do that. Because you, you're blessing the witch that is killing your son. Are you serious? Mm. Are you serious? No. There's a reason why God sent angels to help us, you know. You think God is sitting there watching the devil doing harm to us and does nothing about it? Then what kind of father would he be? You see, we have to think logical because we have adopted a passive Christianity where we don't think that we should fight, where we should war, where we should defend, where we should take up arms. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And only those who are violent can take it. And so there are some dimensions of battles that require that you become, let me say abnormal, because they have painted a side of Christianity to be normal. You know, you're passive and look like a nun. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. That's, that, that's how you look. That's, that ain't Christianity. Paul said he had to wrestle with the beasts. You understand? Okay. Of, of Ephesus. I think it was uh, which apostle spoke that, you know, your money and your money returned to you. You understand? There, there, are some, there are some things in the Bible that if we should pick it out, you will say, hey, I'm going to teach this. Believe me, I'm going to teach it so that we understand um, that there are some things that people say, but it's not grounded in word, honestly. And you can't sit down and let the devil kill you. Really? Am I going to die before my time? Am I stupid? I'm not. I've come under certain levels of attack. And those levels of attack, if I didn't fire back, I would be dead. If I didn't fire back, I told you about a witch that attacked me. And the Bible said, hear me about the Bible says, <laughs> in the dream, I was taken into the heavenly realms. And the woman came and she said, who are you? Because the community I went into, I lifted my hands and I said, every witch inside here, I have come. I said, I have come to take over. I said, whatever altar is operating in this place, it is now broken, fallen down and inoperative. I now establish the altar of the Lord and the name of the Lord in this community. And I take over now. And I put on my hand and I go to sleep. Two days later, the witch came. Who are you? I said, who wants to know? <laughs> who wants to know? And she went up in the air and she released an handkerchief at me. The handkerchief is a sign of a curse. It's a weapon of attack. Okay? And it's a curse. Yeah. Now, I stood back and I said, in the name of Jesus. When I said in the name of Jesus, the handkerchief went back. Wow. And slapped her. When it slapped her, she jerked and she went higher. She said, who are you? I said, who wants to know? She released mm -hmm. a bigger handkerchief at me. I said, the blood of Jesus. And I was speaking with authority in the dream. Yes. And when, it, when I said the blood of Jesus, it went back and slapped her again. Mm -hmm. This time she went higher, as high as she could go. I was down there on the ground looking at her. But of course, you know, I'm not on the ground. I'm in the air. Yeah, yeah. So when she released the biggest handkerchief that she could release, I said, now you will know who I am. And I took my stance. You know, like when they say any mark, get set, go. I took my yes. stance. One foot before me 
one foot behind me and I took my stance and I put my hand like this. And I said, now you will know who I am. I said, the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I sent it up. And it, Let me use a word that will not be too kosher for some of you because I have to describe what happened. It clattered out of the air. <laughs> Do you understand? It, it slapped her out of the air. Slap is too, too nominal to describe what happened to her. It clapped her out of the air in real Jamaican terms. And she fell to the ground. When she fell to the ground, I saw an encirclement of witches that came around her, picked her up as if she was dead. When I mm. saw that, I said, I'm not staying in this dream anymore. I am out of there. Bam, I came out of the dream and, and woke up. In real <laughs> life, the woman that appeared to me in the dream, I don't want to give away too much because the woman that appeared to me in the dream did not talk to me for as long as I live in that community. If wow. I come outside, she run inside. <laughs> if I'm outside, she doesn't come outside. Wow. The last thing she did was to send a cat. You see, you're pricking me. She sent a cat. The cat was <laughs> invisible at the door. When, uh, when my family was eating food and the cat was penetrating my soul. You understand? Penetrating mm -hmm. my soul. Amen. Mm -hmm. 